Today's lecture is about the maximum likelihood estimation method. This lecture is the fourth in a sequence of lectures on methods for nonlinear estimation methods for nonlinear models. We've previously discussed the very general est M estimation framework, going into detail with nonlinear least squares in particular. So today we'll harvest some of the results from our earlier work in M estimation and apply them in the context of maximum likelihood methods. Throughout, we'll use as an example the appropriate model, which constitutes one instance of a binary response model. You'll see binary response models in much more detail in lectures to follow. First, let's discuss the aim of maximum likelihood estimation. Earlier, that is in earlier lectures, we focused on modeling particular features of the conditional distribution of y given x. Again, y representing some outcome and x possible conditioning variables or regressors. We've mainly focused on models for the conditional mean, but we could also have tried to incorporate a model for the conditional variance or other features. Now, maximum likelihood estimation, or the method of maximum likelihood, is much more ambitious in that when, a, when studying the framework of maximum likelihood estimation, we're formulating a model for the entire distribution of y given x, not just particular features. So why would you ever do maximum likelihood estimation? That is, what are the advantages advantages of this approach? Well, because we formulate a model for the entire conditional distribution, we have as much structure as we could possibly hope for. To the extent that structure implies information, it should come as no surprise that the maximum likelihood estimator is in fact efficient. That is, we cannot hope to do better than the maximum likelihood estimator. Moreover, since we're postulating or formulating a model for the entire conditional distribution, we can, having estimates or having maximum likelihood estimates at our disposal, we could in principle estimate any feature of this distribution. We could, for example, estimate the conditional mean or the conditional variance, or higher order moments. We could also estimate conditional probabilities or, or probability of lying within some fixed interval, say, depending on our object of interest. And all of these quantities are, not only are all of these quantities estimable within a maximum likelihood estimation framework, we could also think about estimating derivatives thereof, where by derivatives, I mean derivatives with respect to x. So those were the advantages. What are the drawbacks? That is, why would you not want to do maximum likelihood estimation? The main drawback of maximum likelihood estimation is really a lack of robustness. Now, earlier, I mentioned that using the entire distribution of y given x was an advantage. That is true, but only if we've correctly specified the entire distribution. If one or more features of this conditional distribution are misspecified, the resulting maximum likelihood estimates will be inconsistent, at least in general. All right, having discussed the various advantages as well as drawbacks of the maximum likelihood estimation framework, let's go into a bit more detail. Now, the rest of the video goes as follows. We'll present the framework in more detail and use as a running example a probit model. We'll then talk about our notion of identification within this framework and how it leads to solution uniqueness in a particular population problem. Then we'll spend some time talking about the various asymptotic properties, focusing on consistency and asymptotic normality, and then 
how we would do inference by consistently estimating the asymptotic variance. So what is the maximum likelihood framework? Here, as already mentioned, the object of interest in our maximum likelihood framework is really the entire conditional density, or true density, if you will, of out, the uh, possibly vector of outcomes yi given conditioning variables xi. Here we'll denote this true density by p0, and we'll use as the dummy arguments of this function y and x all the same letters as the random variables, but without the subscripts. The possible, the possible values that these this pair of random variables can take on will denote by this script y and script x, although we'll leave that out in what follows. Now in this framework, we shouldn't take the word density too seriously. If y is completely discrete, then we're really dealing with a p0, which is a probability mass function. If y is completely continuous, then we're dealing with a probability density function. But in general, this current framework allows for a mixture of discrete as well as continuous components in y. So in what follows, I'll use an integral notation whenever we're talking about expectations or other components involving integration or expectations. But if we're dealing with a con completely discrete outcome, then you should think of these as sums. All right, so this was the object of interest, the true density, p naught of an outcome giving regressors. For, as our model for this true density, we'll use a parametric model, here indicated by a set of functions f of both y and x, which are indexed by some parameter vector theta. As usual, we'll use capital theta to denote the possible or candidate parameterizations which is a subset of RP. Throughout, we'll rely on the following model assumptions, that is, assumptions placed on our model. We'll assume that all of these Fs are legitimate densities. That is, no matter what triplet, y, x, and theta that I look at, evaluated that that triplet f is non-negative. Moreover, no matter what pair x and theta I look at, if I integrate out y, then I get an integral of 1. In this sense, these functions are legitimate densities. We'll also make an assumption of correct specification. That is, we'll assume that there's some value some candidate parameter, let's call it theta naught, for which our model for the true density coincides with the true density. That is, the functions p naught and f at theta naught coincide. They're equal for each possible pair y and x. Right. In our M estimation framework, we took as our notion of identification so this is in our M estimation framework to mean that the true parameter, which we'll think of theta naught as being, as the unique solution argument to a certain population problem, namely the expectation over some function q where we're minimizing with respect to theta. 
This notion of identification is a bit abstract, and here we'll make use of a different notion of identification, which is a bit more intuitive. So, consider the following definition, which states that theta naught, the true theta, is identified if and only if any other parameterization, theta, yields a model for the true density, which differs from the true density, at some pair y and x. That is, any other parameterization than the true one yields a density which is different than the true density. We'll show that our assumptions of correct specification and theta naught being identified to imply that theta naught is the unique solution to the following population problem. Here the population problem involves maximizing the expected log of the density or conditional density of y given x, where maximization is with respect to theta our candidate parameterizations. By changing the sign of the objective function, we see that theta naught may equivalently be expressed as the unique solution to a minimization problem, where we're minimizing the expected negative log of the conditional density of y given x. With this observation in mind, we may therefore, if we take as our q function in the m estimation framework, the negative log of the conditional density, we may view theta naught as an m estimate. Going from here, estimation is straightforward. Specifically, the analogy principle suggests the following sample problem, where we maximize the average of the conditional likelihood contributions. That is, we, ma we maximize the average of the log of the conditional density evaluated at the ith point of data and viewed as a function of theta. We'll then define a maximum likelihood estimator, or LME for short, as any solution, call it theta hat, to this sample problem. Again, if we recast this maximization problem and as, as a minimization problem, we may view every maximum likelihood estimator as an M estimator. That is, the maximum likelihood estimation framework is really a special case of the M estimation framework. We next illustrate our framework in the context of a probit model. We'll then draw back to this particular example in later calculations. All right, so the probit model involves a binary outcome, yi, which is scalar then, and binary in the sense uh, that it can only take on two possible values, zero and one. The probit model for the conditional density of y given x uses the this capital phi of x and theta, an inner product in x and theta, where capital phi is the standard normal CDF. That is capital phi. Capital phi is the integral all the way up to t, integrating against the standard normal density, which is sometimes called lowercase phi. And here the relevant parameter space is again just some subset of RP. Since we're dealing with a binary outcome, its conditional density is completely determined by the probability of it being either zero or one. For this reason, 
For this model to be correctly specified, it suffices that there's some parameterization, theta naught, which we'll think of as the true theta, such that the probability that y is 1 given x is capital theta at xi theta naught. Here on the left hand side, we're dealing with the true density at 1 given xi. And the reason why this is sufficient for correct specification is that the probability of seeing 0 instead is just 1 minus the probability of seeing 1. So, in the, load, in the probe at framework, the model density of y given x, that is f, takes the following form. It's capital phi at x theta to the power of y multiplied by 1 minus capital phi at x, x theta to the power of 1 minus y, where y is either 0 or 1. The log likelihood contribution follows from the density upon evaluating at the ith data point and viewing the result and taking logs and viewing the results as a function of theta. Here the ith log likelihood contribution takes this form. As a result, the probit estimator, which is a maximum likelihood estimator, follows from solving or maximizing the average over the probit log likelihood contributions. So these are log likelihood contributions. All right, so we've we introduced this alternative notion of identification, which is which is relevant in our maximum likelihood framework. We next show how this notion of identification implies solution uniqueness when talking about the population problem. Hence, we show that this more intuitive notion of identification suffices for identification in our earlier M estimation sets. So, what we'll do here is to show that is to establish the following claim stating that if the true theta is identified then it's the unique solution to the relevant population problem that is theta naught solves the population problem in that it is an arc max but it is in fact the unique arc max for this purpose we'll invoke what's known as Jensen's inequality. This inequality states that if we look at a concave function, let's call it G, and any random variable, let's call it Z, then the expected value of this concave function of C is at most the concave function at the expected value. That is, if I pull the expected value inside, then I must be blowing up the result, at least in a weak inequality sense. So this is typically referred to as Jensen's inequality, and it yields a weak inequality. One may establish strict inequality, provided that G is strictly concave, and C is non-constant, that is, Z is a legitimate, legitimately random variable. By establishing a strict inequality, I mean that the resulting inequality in Jensen is strict. All right, so we're trying to establish that the true parameterization uniquely solves the population problem. For this purpose, let's fix any parameterization theta. This could be anything 
from our parameter space for now. Now we'll apply Jensen's inequality using as a function g the natural logarithm, which is definitely concave, and as, as our random variable z, the likelihood ratio. This is the likelihood ratio comparing theta, the candidate parameter, to theta naught, the true parameter. Now, if we then take the expectation of g of z with these definitions in mind, and calculate the expectation given xi. Then we get the left-hand side here. So by Jensen's inequality, if we pull the expectation inside the concave function, that is, we take g of the conditional expectation of z given xi, we must, must get a result which is at least as large. So this was, this was our first application of Jensen's inequality. We'll next play around with the right-hand side here in order to simplify this expression. Specifically, we'll look at the right-hand side expectation and show that it is equal to 1. To this end, note the following. If we write, write out the right-hand side expectation, in terms of an integral, what we're doing here when we're taking the expectation with respect to y given xi, we're integra integra integrating against the true density, p0 integrating over y, holding x fixed at xi. Now, if our model is correctly specified, which we earlier assumed earlier, then this true density must in fact be our model density at theta naught. Hence, this denominator and our what we're integrating against cancel out. And what we're left with is the integral of our model at the candidate parameter theta. Now we use our assumption of legitimate densities to argue that no matter the value of the conditioning variable, right, this is some element of this possibility set of x's, no matter what value we look at, when integrating against y, we must get as a result 1, because that's what that's part of the meaning of ha dealing with a legitimate density. Now going back to our earlier inequality from Jensen, substituting in the right hand side here, that's just calculated to be 1, we see that the expected lock likelihood ratio conditional on xi is at most the log of 1. But we know what the log of 1 is, it is 0. Hence, Jensen's inequality, what it really does, it, is provide, it provides us with a relationship between the log of the candidate model and the log of the true model. So if we expand the log to write the log of the ratio as a difference in log and rearrange, we get this relationship, which I'll carry on to the next slide. So what have we, sh what have we shown? We've shown that conditional on xi, 
the expected log likelihood at the true parameter is at least the expected log likelihood at theta, this candidate parameter. Since this must, must hold, no matter the value of the conditioning variable, if we take expectations over xi, we get the same relationship but with unconditional expectations. That is, the expected log likelihood at the true parameter is at least the expected log likelihood of the candidate parameter. But the expected log likelihood was our population criterion function. And since nothing in our previous argument hinges on this candidate parameter being one thing or another, that is, it, it was completely arbitrary, this shows that our true theta maximizes the population criterion. That is, it solves the population problem. All right, so what have we shown? We've shown that the true theta solves the population problem. That is, it maximizes the expected log likelihood. Now this only shows that the true parameter is a solution to the population problem. That is, a solution exists, but it doesn't show that this solution is unique. However, recall that we've only used the weak version of Jensen's inequality, not the strict one. If we can use the strict one, then we may also establish a stronger result. So going back to our assumption that the true theta is identified, we see that the implied likelihood ratio, which we earlier called z, for some candidate theta, no matter the candidate theta, the resulting variable is non-constant, right? Since the numerator and denominator must differ at some values of y and x, which happen with positive probability. Now, since the log function, actual log, is strictly concave, the strict version of Jensen's inequality applies. And going over or tracing back our steps from earlier, we see that we get the following conclusion, which states that the res the inequality in question relating the expected log likelihoods must be strict whenever we're dealing with a parameterization different from the true one. Hence, under our earlier assumptions of not only correct specification, but also identification, the population problem not only has a solution, which involves theta naught, but theta naught must in fact be the unique solution. That is, it is the unique maximizer. Having related the concepts of identification and solution uniqueness in our maximum likelihood framework, we next move on to discussing the asymptotic properties of maximum likelihood estimators. For this purpose, First, recall that every maximum likelihood estimator may be viewed as an M estimator. All we needed to do was to use as our Q function from the M estimation framework the negative log likelihood, where here we view the data WI as the pair of outcomes and conditioning variables. Since every maximum likelihood estimator may be viewed as an M estimator, we could go ahead and harvest our results from earlier lectures by appealing to these general theorems. We've earlier de developed a theorem establishing consistency of M estimators. This was theorem 12.2 in the book. and I'll and also a theorem establishing asymptotic normalities, asymptotic normality of M estimators, 
or theorem 12.3. And we'll use this ex we'll use this strategy. That is, we'll set up for application of these general results by verifying the relevant conditions underlying the two theorems. So that's what we'll do next, starting with consistency. So recall here the general consistency theorem for M estimation. The theorem goes as follows. Provided the parameter space, capital theta, is compact, which means that in our context, it's closed and bounded. And the Q function involved is continuous in theta over the entire parameter space. And also that the true theta uniquely minimizes the population criterion function, which we earlier referred to as identif an identification condition. Then, up to some technical stuff, we may show that a minimizer of the resulting sample problem exists, call it theta hat, and the resulting sequence of, or any resulting sequence of solutions will be consistent for the true parameter theta naught. With this recap in mind, We'll simply ask ourselves the question, are the, are the conditions verified in the context of maximum likelihood? If so, we would have established consistency of maximum likelihood estimators. Well, what are the conditions? Compactness, continuity, and uniqueness of the solution. First up, compactness of the parameter space. Well, this assumption is somewhat hard to derive from more primitive conditions. So at this stage, we'll simply assume that the parameter space is compact. This may or may not be controversial in particular applications, but for now, we'll go ahead and assume it. What about continuity of the Q function, which in our maximum likelihood framework amounts to the negative log likelihood function? that is viewed as a function of theta, the parameterization. Is this a continuous function? Well, the negative log is a continuous function, so it'll, the result will be continuous, provided that we composite it with a continuous density. Hence our model, our collection of Fs, should depend in a continuous manner on the parameterization theta. As a particular example, where this is in fact the case, we can go back to our probit model, where the density was theta of x, no, phi of x theta to the power of y, 1 minus phi of x theta to the power of 1 minus y. We see here that continuity of F follows from continuity of capital Phi, which is in fact the case in the probit model, right? Because a standard normal random variable is continuously distrib distributed. Hence, its CDF must be continuous. Lastly, what about uniqueness? Well, we know here in our maximum likelihood framework that provided that theta naught is identified in the sense that any different parameterization yields a different density than the true one, then this resulting population problem is solved by theta naught and in a unique manner, as we just derived. Hence, if we're willing to assume a compact parameter space, continuous densities that is a continuous model, if you will, and an identified parameter or identified true theta, then consistency of maximum likelihood estimators follows from our earlier work. For this reason, we don't state a separate theorem.
What about asymptotic normality? We'll take a similar approach to establishing asymptotic normality. That is, we'll refer back to our earlier results for M estimators. So recall our theorem, which provided sufficient conditions for asymptotic normality of M estimators. The theorem stated that, provided that the true theta is the unique minimizer of the population problem, and the, it was interior to the parameter space, assumed to be compact. And also that the Q function involved was not only continuous, but in fact twice continuously differentiable on the interior of the parameter space. Then up to some additional conditions, some of them being technical, the resulting or the M estimate, M estimator sequence was asymptotically normal with an asymptotic variance of a sandwich form. Here the two components involved in the sandwich involved the expected value of a Hessian term, the Hessian being of the Q function, and the expected value of the outer product of the scores, which were the gradients of the Q function. And we could go ahead and apply this theorem, which is theorem 12.3 in Woldrich. I'm on after taking a couple of precautions. First of all, the theorem is designed for minimization, or estimators that solve a minimization problem. So as a first step, we'll turn our maximization problem, involved in defining the maximum likelihood estimator, into a minimization problem by adopting a change of sign. Hence the involved Q function in our framework is again the negative log likelihood contribution viewed as a function of theta. Hence in our above asymptotic normality theorem for M estimators, the scores and Hessians, S and H, should be viewed as the relevant derivatives of the negative of the log likelihood, again, viewed as a function of theta. However, in what follows, we'll adopt this alternative notation, or a different notation. So in what follows, the score contribution, SI, will be the derivative of the log likelihood contribution with respect to theta, that is, without a minus. And the Hessian contribution, HI, will be the derivative of this newly defined score which then, then is the gradient of the log likelihood contribution, again, without a minus. Hence, the bread component of the asymptotic variance, A0, or inverse of the bread, if you will, is, the, is in this context the negative expectation of a Hessian term. Since we've decided to keep track of the minus, since the since the minus here is not involved in our different in our definition of the Hessian, we have to include it later on. Again, we could go ahead and apply theorem twelve point three at least if we're willing to make additional assumptions. So those assumptions here would be to assume that the true parameter true theta is interior to the parameter space, and that the log likelihood is not only continuous, but twice continuously differentiable on the interior of the parameter space, plus some additional technical conditions that we won't worry about today. However, we in, in our maximum likelihood framework, more structure is available, and we'll go ahead and exploit this structure prior to stating our asymptotic normality result. This particular structure that we're after is known as the information matrix equality. So what is the information matrix equality, or sometimes referred to as the information matrix identity? Well, this matrix state, or this result states that under quite mild conditions, which strictly speaking involve additional assumptions, but under quite mild additional assumptions, 
the negative of the expected Hessian coincides with the expected value of the outer product of the scores, where all of these quantities are evaluated at the true theta. This is sometimes referred to as the information matrix equality or unconditional information matrix equality to be precise, since the involved expectations are unconditional. In fact, under the same set of conditions, a conditional version of this information matrix equality holds. However, most important to us is the unconditional one. Now, if we inspect the unconditional information matrix equality, we see that it relates the negative expected Hessian, which we call A0, to the expected outer product of the scores, which we called B0. And the information matrix equality states that these two matrices are identical. As a result, the asymptotic variance, which in our general M estimation framework was A0 times B, or A0 inverse times B0 times A0 inverse, simplifies to simply a naught inverse or B naught inverse, depending on how you look at it. Finally, we've arrived at our asymptotic normality statement for maximum likelihood estimators. The theorem here states that if theta naught is identified in the current maximum likelihood context, and it is interior to a parameter space assumed to be compact, and the log likelihood function viewed as a function of theta is not only continuous, but twice continuously differentiable on the interior, interior of the parameter space, then up to some assumptions here, including assumptions justifying this the information matrix equalities on the previous slide, we may establish asymptotic normality of the maximum likelihood estimator with an asymptotic variance given only by a single term, namely the inverse of the negative of the expected Hessian. As a result, the asymptotic variance of the maximum likelihood estimator is this inverse of the expected Hessian, or negative expected Hessian, divided by the sample size. We next move on to talk about how one may estimate this asymptotic variance in a consistent manner. Since the asymptotic variance, as thus just established, takes the form of a naught inverse divided by n. In order to consistently estimate the asymptotic variance, it suffices to consistently estimate a naught. Now in our likelihood context, there are at least three candidates for, for an estimator of a naught. Let's call it a hat. One we may view as the least structural type of estimator. Least structural in the sense of our earlier nomenclature from discussing inference in the M estimation framework. This estimator would calculate the Hessian contributions and average over them, and then replace the true parameter with our maximum likelihood estimator. In our case, since we've adopted this we've adopted to not carry the minus on the Hessian term, we would have to take a mi the minus of the resulting average. But otherwise, the procedure is exactly as we've earlier, as we've discussed earlier. A somewhat more structural approach would use instead of the Hessian contributions, their conditional expectations. So if we define, if we denote the negative conditional Hessian, conditioning on 
xi such that the expectation is with respect to y i given xi. Then we could use as an alter as an alternative estimator the average of these conditional Hessian terms upon replacing the two parameter with our maximum likelihood estimator. In our maximum likelihood framework, an alternative third estimator presents itself. Namely, if we go back to our unconditional information matrix equality, then we see that when we're trying to estimate the asymptotic variance, we're estimating A0, we could similarly focus on estimating B0 in a consistent manner. Hence, we could use as our estimator for A0, which would coincide with B0, the average of our estimates of the score contributions, or rather their outer product. Now, each of these three estimators will be consistent for A0, which again coincides with B0, under mild conditions, which would, to be fair, which would have to be added to our previous conditions. So, which one should we pick when implementing or estimating our asymptotic variance in practice? We've already discussed general themes or general features of various estimation approaches in our earlier lecture on inference in the M estimation framework, but it doesn't hurt to go through some of these features in our present context. So we have three options as our estimator for the asymptotic variance. Once invol one involves a sum of Hessian contributions, one involves the sum of conditional Hessian contributions, and another involves the sum of products of scores or score contributions. When it comes to the first option involving a sum of Hessian contributions, this option is under our present set of assumptions always available. That is, you can always calculate these if, if we have twice continuous differentiability of the li likelihood, we can always calculate the Hessian function, which is a matrix valued function, and then evaluate it at the likelihood estimator. Note here though that in calculating the Hessian, we have to do second order differentiation, which may or may not be a difficult task for either the user or the computer. Now, since the maximum likelihood estimator solves the, solves the sample problem, the inside here that we are taking the inverse of will always be at least positive semi-definite. This follows from the second order condition or second order necessary condition for optimization. What about the second option, which involves a sum of outer products of score contribution. Now this option is easier to compute and in fact these score contributions will often be available to us from our use of optimization algorithm already. Moreover, the scores involve calculation of the scores or estimation thereof involves only first order differentiation, which is an easier task and the resulting matrix that we're trying to compute the inverse of will always be at least positive semi-definite. The third option, involving a sum of conditional Hessians, is a bit harder to derive, since it in general involves calculation of Hessians, or at least scores. However, it's often positive definite in the sample, and in general, simulation studies indicates, indicate that it has good behavior even in small sample. As the final point of this lecture, we'll go into detail with these calculations going back to our earlier probed example. So the next couple of slides will be about how to estimate the asymptotic variance of the probed estimator. 
For this purpose, recall that the conditional probit density takes this form, where we have theta or phi of x theta to the power of y multiplied by 1 minus phi of x theta to the power of 1 minus y. For this reason, taking logs and evaluated at the data, we arrive at the log likelihood contribution, Li, which we here view as a function of theta. Now, in order to, to illustrate the necessary calculations, we'll use our as our as our uh, asymptotic variance estimator the third option, that is the one involving conditional Hessian terms. Our strategy or procedure goes as follows: we'll derive the score contributions by hand, then we'll derive the conditional Hessian term, which could be derived by further calculation of the Hessians, and then calculating conditional expectations. But we'll take a different approach, using the conditional information matrix equality instead. Lastly, we sum over these contributions and replace the unknown parameter by our maximum likelihood estimator. The result will then follow from inversion. All right, so the first step is to derive the score function. This step is relatively straightforward, so here I'm skipping the details. I'll simply say that upon differentiating the log likelihood contributions with respect to theta and gathering term, we get a score which takes this form. Note here that the score involves a the difference between the outcome and our model for its uh, for its probability of being one multiplied by a bunch of stuff which depends only on x. Next, step two, we derive the conditional Hessian term, a of xi and theta naught. Now we've defined this to be the negative of the ex conditional expectation of our Hessian, the Hessian being of the log likelihood function. But we could, we could equally have defined it as being the conditional expectation of the outer product of the scores. Again, all of these quantities being evaluated at the true parameter. Now, the reason for this second equality is the conditional information matrix equality, which we're here assuming to hold. If we take our earlier calculation for the scores, evaluate the result at theta naught, and take the product of the two, we may insert it inside this expectation to get the latter conditional expectation. And now we see that this conditional expectation, which holds fixed xi, is really only over one component as given by this term or the square of the term in squared brackets. This is the only term that involves y, the rest involves only x, and may it therefore be viewed as constant for the purposes of this conditional expectation. All right, so here I've copied through our earlier expression for, for A with a conditional Hessian contributions, and made use of the fact that all of this stuff depends only on x in order to pull it outside this conditional expectation, which holds x as fixed. Hence, in order to, our calculation of a now boils down to, or calculation of the conditional Hessian contributions, now boils down to the cal a calculation of the, this conditional expectation. Note here that what we're looking at is the expect, expected value of a binary outcome minus its success probability. The probability of it being one given xi. All of these quantities being conditional on xi. Hence, what we're looking at here is the expected square difference between a binary outcome and its conditional mean. That is, we're looking at its conditional variance.
Well, we know we we've, we've since our model is correct, we know the form of this success probability. It's theta of x i theta naught. So the conditional variance, which is again this term, is just the probability of success. times the probability of failure. This follows from our from an introductory class on probability theory and calculations using Bernoulli random variables. Hence, if we substitute in our newly found expression for this conditional variance term in our earlier expression, and cancel terms, we see that the conditional Hessian contributions take this takes this form. Note here that there's no square on the terms in the denominator. Finally, the third step amounts to taking these expressions for the conditional Hessian contributions, summing them up and then substituting the true parameter with our maximum likelihood estimator. Hence, we get estimates of the conditional Hessian contributions, which takes the following form, and our final estimator or variance matrix estimator for probit, this AVAR hat, follows from inversion. Now, provided this matrix is in fact invertible, we see that it must be positive definite. Since we're dealing with the sum of matrices, these x, x prime x matrices are always positive semi-definite. We're multiplying them with positive numbers, hence their sum must also be at least positive semi-definite. Hence when it is invertible, the result must be positive definite as well. Now you can arrive at the exact same expression for the variance matrix estimator for propin using second order differentiation. And I highly encourage you guys to go through this example to see that you understand the various steps involved.